Hey, Gary Hoover here. Today I want to talk about looking for the big pattern. One of the things that I see when I talk to business people and some of my students is that they're too focused on the little example and not reaching out to see the bigger picture. Even journalists get into this trap. I noticed over the years there were a number of stories about the decline of the small family farm. And I saw them on television, I saw them in the newspaper, I saw story after story. I said, look, oh, there's all these poor little family farms and they're disappearing and being replaced by big corporate agriculture. And the stories when they thought about why this is going on and whether it was good or bad and and you know what was at work here it was really about oh well you know the government gives subsidies to big corporate farms um, this and that you know all these things and most of that reasoning was specific to that one example to the family farms but in all those years that I saw that stuff I never saw a single story I can't remember one about the decline of the family-owned pharmacy or drugstore or and replacement by the big chain stores. Maybe in a drugstore industry magazine or at a trade show you'd hear about that, probably so. But I didn't see it in the general press where they were talking about the family farm. I didn't see anything about the decline of um, um, locally owned independent newspapers. I didn't see anything about the decline of mom and pop supermarkets. All these were trends that were well underway long before the rise of Walmart. You hear that a lot. The thing is, is when I look at those things, I see a big overarching thing. I see that in some industries, at some times, there is a movement from a lot of small, fragmented operations to larger, more efficient, more productive ones. And there can be a lot of factors at work. And there's no question that something like agriculture, that government subsidies for big farms and ranches has an effect, or that there can be specific factors in each industry, but it doesn't change the fact that what's really at work here is this great big trend. And then the challenge becomes to think about, well, if there's a big trend at work, and it ain't about farms, it ain't about drugstores, it's about broad economic issues, big long-term trends, uh, maybe cycles. Maybe it goes one way for a while and goes another way for a while. You know, only then can you begin to think, well, what else might it apply to? Where might it happen next? It's just like these days I talked to a lot of friends about the rise of the e-book and the death or decline or whatever of the old-fashioned printed book. As you may know, I live with like 50,000 books. I love regular old-fashioned books. And, and, um, uh, and actually, I'm not a consumer of e-books for, for different reasons. I think it's a cool idea. And God bless you if you sell them, buy them, uh, produce them, write them. Um, but, you know, but I, in all these conversations about, oh, the, the death of the book, and, uh, and often they're, woe is us, woe is this, this is awful and everything. Well, it's not about books. It's about media in general. It's about records or eight tracks or cassette tapes or whatever. It's about books. It's about magazines. It's about newspapers. It's about all these different forms of media which historically had been physical, physical book, a vinyl album, a printed uh, newspaper. Here's one right here, you know. Um, and that really, first of all, is just a physical media. That's all it is. I mean, the truth, the value, the validity of a book or a magazine or a newspaper or a phonograph record was not in the plastic, was not in the paper. Any more that when you, than when you use a computer file, and gosh, when I started, it was on cassette tape, and then it moved to giant floppy disks, and then little floppy disks, and then even littler, little three-inch floppy disks. And I forget what came next, but if you've been around, you know PsyQuest and iOmega and cartridges. And then finally on little chips and thumb drives and burning DVDs. And now you can fill a Blu-ray. Well, in 20 years, nobody's going to be using DVDs or Blu-rays to store data. Nobody's going to be using, well, maybe they'll still be using thumb drives. I don't know, but they will be huge in terms of what they can hold in a little tiny space. In any case, so, and nobody really cares. I mean, it's a pain in the butt, and I think there are a lot of business opportunities working with all that, but um, 
it, it, it's that's just a media. Well, what's happened? Books have become lightweight. I mean, that's there are many advantages and negatives, pros and cons to going to an ebook, going to a Nook or a Kindle or an iPad. But among the many positives is just weight and the time and the cost of shipping because now you can fly them through the air. And that's happening with movies. I left movies off here, DVDs and all that. So again, it's a case of what's the big trend here and why is it at work? And then if it's really in large part just a matter of being weightless, you know, because data is weightless, it's just electrons turned on or off or whatever. I'm not an electrical engineer. The thing is, what else might it apply to? What else might go weightless that isn't in this list? Um, and, and so again, I'm looking for the big pattern. And, and one that just occurred to me the other day, I just heard on the news, there's 1,200 food carts or food trucks in Austin. You know, people are selling just everything you can imagine, from cupcakes to barbecue. There's 1,200 of them, and I understand we're the second biggest city in the U.S. after New York for that. Well, I want to know why. And the first answer might be, oh, well, rents are too high for restaurants. Well, no, that's not really true. I mean, there are plenty of restaurants to invite. Oh, people don't like to eat and sit down in a restaurant. I mean, you'll hear all kinds of crazy excuses. No, it's not true. Go look around. There's all these restaurants who are going, why is this food cart thing coming up? Uh, does, it, does it maybe have more to do with the fact these are things we don't need all day? We just need them breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks or whatever. Or maybe we want them near work at lunchtime and near our houses in the evening, so portability, motion moves around. Whatever the underlying reasons are, they are likely to affect more things than just food over time. And then it becomes what comes next. Because only when you see that big pattern, you step back and see the big picture, can you begin to think about, well, now what are the real implications for this? So those are my two bits uh, for today. I'll see you later.